to this meeting of the uh, workshop series on using Texas data and policy analysis. We are thrilled to have Jennifer Pan with us today. Uh, Jennifer is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at Stanford University. And before that, she got her PhD from Harvard University. Uh, Jennifer is the author of uh, well-renowned books and uh, seminal articles across a number of fields. Her work uh, really set the agenda for the computational analysis of Chinese censorship strategy, and that's appeared across a number of outlets. And today she's going to tell us a little bit about how, uh, about how China reframes uh, and uses counter-narrative strategies on uh, state media using Twitter, which is obviously timely given the events of the world. So uh, Jennifer, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to talk about a new working paper that's entitled Reframing China Counter Narrative Strategies of Chinese State Media. Um, so over the past few years, media outlets controlled by the Chinese government have really aggressively expanded their presence on global media's platforms. As of today, CGTN, which is the premier kind of China's premier outward facing media outlet, CGTN stands for China Global Television Network. It has hundreds of millions of followers on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, all of, you know, all of these platforms which are not available domestically. Um, so there's agreement that China has been really aggressive in expanding this international media presence, but there's a lot of disagreement over what these efforts are and how they should be labeled. So are they public diplomacy, soft power, sharp power, propaganda, influence operations? Part of that disagreement comes from the kind of inherent fuzziness of some of these concepts, as well as the conceptual stretching that some of these concepts have undergone. But the disagreement also comes from the, just the lack of basic empirical description of what messages these outward facing media outlets are disseminating. So in today's talk, I'm going to share what I'm going to share with you is a description is a quantitative description of tweets made by CGTN from 2013 to 2020. I'll start by describing a bit about the presence of CGTN on Twitter, then um, I'll hone in on the content of the uh, messages. And then in the end, I'll try to put what CGTN is doing in the context of the global media environment and international reporting on China. So the first thing is just a little bit of background. Outward media is not a new thing at all for China. It happened in the Maoist era, um, but with economic reforms in 1987, party leadership under Deng Xiaoping wanted to tell the world about new China and make the world aware of changes taking place in China. But even though the intention was to try to tell the world what was happening for most of the 1990s and 2000s, these outward efforts were reactive and they were reactions to negative international media coverage of domestic Chinese events like Tiananmen Democracy Movement in 1989, SARS in 2003, unrest in Western China in 2008 and 2009. Um, one of ex one examples of the one example of this is in 2008 there was unrest in Tibet, and the Chinese government prohibited all foreign media from entering the region. And so, what media organizations did was relied on information from the Tibetan government in exile in India. And the result was that the news reporting was much more critical than Beijing had expected. Um, and altogether, kind of this this continual process of limiting information access, and then reacting to negative coverage has generated a really strong belief um, among CCP leadership that international media reporting against China is biased. And the motivation for a lot of these outward media efforts is then to correct what the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party perceives as misconceptions about China. And these efforts uh, ramp up under, under Hu Jintao and then intensify under the leadership of Xi Jinping. Uh, so in 2007, 
this is when Hu Jintao was in power, he launched new campaigns to try to influence global perceptions of China. And the focus then was on mega events. So the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, as well as promoting Chinese language and culture through organizations such as Confucius Institutes. In 2013, when Xi Jinping took power, he immediately emphasized the need for China to build on and expand these previous efforts to shape global public opinion. Uh, this is a pretty frequently cited quote from Xi's speech in 2003 at the National Propaganda and, and Ideological Work Conference. And he called on the CCP to innovate on external publicity methods, strive to create new ideas, new categories, and new narratives uh, for domestic and or uh, foreign audiences to tell Chinese stories well and to spread Chinese voice as well. Uh, a number of action plans and kind of bureaucratic restructuring followed the 2013 speech. Um, and among them was the consolidation and rebranding of several divisions of Chinese Central Television, which is the uh, state controlled television network. They had outward facing English language and foreign language channels, but they were all consolidated at the end of 2016 and rebranded as China Global Television Network. And CGTN, uh, we usually call it CGTN, along with China National Radio and China Radio International formed a new media conglomerate that had a very elevated political status under the direct control of um, uh, Chinese Communist Party leadership. So what we do um, was collect um, about a hundred thousand, a little over a hundred thousand tweets made by CGTN um, between 2013 and 2020. And um, one thing to note is that the rebranding happened in 2016, but the Twitter account was previously a Twitter account belonging to CCTV. So that's why it existed from 2013. So we collect data going back to 2013 and we can see what happens as the rebranding happens. Um, we also collected the entire list of followers for CGTN. This, is, this collection was about a year ago. Um, and for each follower account, we collected metadata like the um, username, bio, location, URL of account, uh, number of tweets posted, things like that. Um, and then to, to focus, um, to put the activities of CGTN into context, we collected all tweets made by six international uh, media outlets, BBC Breaking News, CNN Breaking News, Fox News, RT, Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Um, we also collected this data between 2013 and 2020. We included RT uh, just to have a comparison of another very prominent international, uh, prominent state controlled media outlet with international presence. And the rest of the outlets were chosen to capture diversity of content focus, like breaking news versus not breaking news, ideological slant, ownership structure, and size of their social media followership. And we collected the same tweet attributes as we did for the CGTN tweets. As, and we also collected the following lists of um, all of these accounts. Okay, so getting into some of the description, um, starting with kind of the trajectory of CGTN on Twitter. What this figure does is just compare the number of followers of CGTN um, uh, with that of other media outlets. And we can see is that among Chinese state controlled media outlets, so these are the bars in dark gray, nearly black, um, CGTN has more followers than Xinhua People's Daily or CCTV. Uh, CGN has slightly fewer followers than um, on Twitter than Washington Post and Wall Street Journal, Fox News, and then it has orders of magnitude fewer followers than the CNN and BBC breaking news accounts. Um, and then on the left there is RT for comparison, at least on Twitter, both on Twitter actually and Facebook, CGTN's following size um, vastly exceed that of um, RT. Okay. Um, Rebranding happened at the end of uh, 2016 and officially kind of the launch happened at the beginning of 2017. And a lot changed with the behavior of CGTN, um, CGTN's Twitter account. One is just this big jump in the total number of tweets that they are making every week. Uh, we see this happening at the beginning of 2017 and that higher level of tweets per week is sustained going forward. 
We also see a uh, big jump in terms of followership. Uh, so the followership of CGTN on Twitter quickly ramps up after the rebranding outpaces that of RT, which is in the light gray. Um, and one, one thing to note here is that Twitter doesn't provide the date at which an account started following another account, but you can infer the earliest possible following date by the fact that the list of followers, when you collect the list of followers, it's ordered by uh, according to date. Um, so what this figure is showing is the plot of cumulative CGTM followers based on the earliest possible following date. Um, one thing that we thought about was whether kind of this increase in followership was more authentic or less. Uh, but we found little indicate that the followers are bot or bot-like, um, or at least no more so than any other media outlet on Twitter. So we look at a lot of different indicators of bot-like or inauthentic uh, behavior, and this figure just shows one of them. Uh, this is the proportion of followers with, without a timeline. So you're getting followed by accounts which have made no posts and comparing CGTM black and Washington Post and light gray. What we can see is that in the last few years, uh, the proportion of followers with no timeline is very similar uh, between CGTN and Washington Post. And if we look at, if I added other media outlets, international media, non-Chinese media outlets, this figure, it would look very similar. Okay. Uh, then going to the content of the CGTN tweets, um, based on the characteristics of the account that I just showed you, because so much changed after that rebranding at the beginning uh, of 2017, in this section and the next section, I'm going to, when we start analyzing the text, I'm going to focus on content from 2017 onward after the rebranding is complete. Um, the first thing I want to show you is this plot. It's the stacked bar, uh, area plot showing on the just the number of tweets made by CGTN that are about China, so in light gray, and completely unrelated to China in, light, uh, in dark gray. So when I say a tweet is about China, that includes tweets about China's domestic affairs, as well as China's relations with other countries. Uh, anything mentioning China or sub-region of China or Chinese officials or policies. We identify, so this, how do we identify this? We do this with regular expression pattern matching, um, which we tested through, I think five or six rounds of iteration. Um, so it's keywords related to ge geographic regions like cities and provinces, as well as other patterns like Chinese Communist Belt, uh, Party, Belt and Road, um, et cetera. The thing with this uh, that surprised us is just the sheer volume of tweets that have nothing to do with China. So across this whole time period, 43% of tweets relate to China. There's a slight increase in the relative proportion of tweets focused in China in the latter half of 2019. Um, that's because of protests in Hong Kong. And there, then there's this relative decrease, uh, relative decrease in share about China in 2020 as COVID-19 spread globally. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on how China is talking about itself, but one thing I want to note is that in the content that's not about China, uh, we analyze that content by, uh, by looking at a current event list that contained about 20,000 events over this time period, and then we use a variety of methods um, to match the content of the tweet to those events. And we find that the proportion of current events CGTN covers is very similar to that of BBC breaking news and CNN breaking news on Twitter. So in other words, all this dark gray stuff, a lot of what CGTN is tweeting that's um, not about China is breaking news. And it's very, very similar to what any international media outlet is doing on Twitter. Okay. Uh, so then turning to our main focus, which is how does CGTN talk about China? Um, how do we go about doing this? So our starting point is kind of the recognition that text, image, video, unstructured data of any type can be organized and described in almost endless ways. You can organize it by topic, by sentiment, by any specific action, opinion, attribute you want. And so 
how do we decide what to do? Um, what we do is we take an approach that begins by exploring the data without imposing any prior categories. So we um, take a random sample um, of, of the data and we have research assistants label the data without us imp imposing any prior category. So they assign multiple labels um, as they want. And then we also do unsupervised learning with topic models. And then we bring those results together with theory and kind of substantive knowledge to then develop um, theoretically relevant ways of categorizing the data. And after we do that, we take a new sample, uh, code that according to these kind of theoretically generated categories, um, and then classify posts into categories um, based on that. So there's this like period of really unstructured data exploration. Um, we, what comes out of that, we, we try to tie that in with theory and kind of substantive knowledge. We generate some hypotheses, then we code a new sample based on that hypotheses and then do the classification in that way. Okay. Um, so with the data exploration, what we do is take a random sample of 500 uh, tweets stratified, stratified by time, uh, by month. We had research members, a team's members of the research team read the post and then just assign whatever label they thought were salient to that tweet. And then we applied um, topic models also to the sample tweets to see if what topics would come about in a more unsupervised fashion. And we noticed a couple of patterns. Um, one is that the tweets consistently emphasize a few uh, positive attributes. Um, one is China's rich culture, history, and natural beauty. So there are lots of posts about natural scenery, pandas, historical um, sites, events, things like that. Um, the second was a lot of emphasis on progress, especially economic progress in terms of economic development. The third uh, was highlighting China's cooperativeness and helpfulness especially internationally, but also domestically. Um, internationally, it was really emphasizing how China works with other countries, other peoples, other organizations to, um, to accomplish things of mutual interest. And, and then the last one was uh, kind of emphasizing China's openness and uh, friendliness. Um, there, I think when, Sometimes when I talk about these attributes, they might seem like obvious things China might emphasize, but in many ways, we didn't expect all of these points. I think based on our kind of prior, more anecdotal encounters with Chinese state media content, we expected the first, this like panda bears sort of, sort of content. Um, but, and maybe we expected some things around economic development. Um, but on the cooperation, helpfulness, friendliness, openness, we didn't expect that as much. Like for example, I expected China to emphasize more its kind of stability, um, uh, its kind of control, but that, that wasn't kind of, that, that didn't rise up to the top when we did this data exploration. Um, so kind of we had these sort of attributes, a, a few other things we noticed, was there were some content that would engage in argumentation directly with uh, Western media outlets. You see something the Washington Post or New York Times says and the next day, CG Chan is saying something directly of uh, refuting that claim. Um, and then there was also breaking news reporting about China that didn't kind of emphasize any particular um, positive attribute. Uh, so we did this and then at some point we were um, reviewing policy documents related to China's outward media strategy. And we realized that the attributes we identified um, kind of bottom up re almost completely coincided with uh, Xi Jinping's strategy for shaping national image, which he laid out in that speech in 2013. Um, he laid out, we actually didn't recognize this initially because of what he was calling the narratives. Um, or what the CCP was calling the narrative. So the, the four narratives were called kind of China's great civilization, China's leader in East Asia, China is responsible, 
and China is a successful major socialist nation. Okay. But it wasn't until we had our explored data analysis and then we looked at the sub narratives associated with each of these that we realized there was a, a, a ton of alignment between what we were seeing and what they had laid out in 2013. Um, so what does it mean to frame China as a great civilization? Um, th there's two parts of that. One is history and one is ethnic diversity and unity. Um, okay, uh, so that's, that's civilization. A leader in East Asia, what that's referring to is actually a really pretty diverse set of things. Um, it includes transparent government, economic development, flourishing culture, social stability, a unified people, um, uh, and natural beauty. Okay, things that you might not think go together, but these are the elements that, uh, according to the CCP, make China a leading country in East Asia. Okay. The fourth is about responsibility. So uh, emphasizing that China is pursuing peaceful development, mutual development, cooperation, not confrontation, that China contributes to global development, defends international justice, and contributes to humanity. Then socialist success actually has nothing to do with like the economic concepts of socialism. Instead, it, it, it's about what the CCP said, calls deconstructing Western discourse hegemony. Uh, and then representing China as open to the outside, approachable, hopeful, and vibrant. Okay. But somehow that went under the heading of socialist, successful socialist nation. Um, but so uh, when we look at the details of this, it matches up a great deal with what we found. And the natural beauty and economic development relate to this narrative of being a leader in East Asia. The cooperation is under this um, uh, uh, frame of responsibility and then this friendliness uh, is under this one around socialist success. Um, so from a theoretical perspective, we can see these narratives as frames for China. So they're uh, kind of the theory on framing draws from a conventional expectancy value model of attitude. So the idea that anything, object, issue, person, policy, event, country has multiple attributes, I. And then an attitude about that thing, it consists of the sum of the product of an individual's evaluation of each attribute, I, and the salience weight of each attribute. And so in light of this, um, this we can see the C CGTN narratives as changing the salience of certain attributes by emphasizing reporting um, on those attributes. Okay. So for example, by reporting on China's trade agreements, this is lending more salience to the attribute of cooperation, especially if that tweet about the trade agreement is about how China is cooperating or um, working with other countries to, to achieve a common goal. Um, and we, we were calling this reframing, um, even though what's going on is just, just framing, uh, because the attributes that CGTN is emphasizing on Twitter differ uh, quite a bit from um, international reporting. Um, and what international reporting, the attributes that international reporting emphasizes. Okay, so now we have the results from data exploration. So, F, which is kind of combining the bottom up ex exploration of the data with analysis of policy documents and our theories of framing, and we begin our data analysis. So, we randomly sample um, another different, another 1,000 tweets that are stratified by month and determine whether the tweets can um, contain content related to four of the reframing categories I introduced. And if not, then we determine is the tweet breaking news or soft news? Um, and soft news are kind of entertainment uh, topics that don't fall under those reframing narratives. And then based on this hand labeled data, we trained, we, uh, what we did was um, trained and compared three binary classification models, uh, naive Bayes, F SVM and logistic regression with different features and their combinations. So all combinations of these features, unigrams, bigrams, word counts, um, TFIDF weights, word embedding vectors. Um, and then we also tested whether pre-processing tweets improves performance for all of the model variants. Um, and what we find is that the logistic 
uh, regression model with unigram and word embedding features perform the best when we look at um, kind of balance of precision and recall with F1 scores as well as accuracy. Um, so then we classify posts using these models. So we're, these are binary models. And so we have one model to say, is it reframing or not? We have another model to say, is it breaking news or not? Um, and the remaining we consider uh, kind of the soft news category. Uh, okay, so that's what we did um, in terms of classification. And what we find is that from that, uh, from the classifier, from the models, is that the majority, the vast majority of tweets related to China contain reframing narratives from the period of 2017 to 2020. So in the overall period, about 76% 76 76 of tweets about China fall into one or more of the narratives. So we didn't um, cl uh, classify the sub-narratives um, because any particular tweet can contain multiple of the sub-narratives and uh, the performance was just not, we didn't think the performance was good enough. Um, but here, I'm just gonna show you the result of the hand coding. Uh, so this will add up to more than a hundred because tweets go into multiple uh, sub-narratives. And what we can see is that economic development and cooperation are the most frequently emphasized followed by tweets about China's rich culture and natural beauty, and then posts related to refuting Western discourse hegemony. So the, the refuting West, Western discourse hegemony, which is a mouthful, are posts that are arguing against points that are made in international media. Um, one thing to note is actually what's not here. There's no narrative or some narrative that, that pushes, like say a China model, of political or economic institutions or development. There may be elements of this in um, when China talks about its economic development or stability uh, or transparency. Um, but the emphasis here is really just about China, how great it is, um, all the great things about it, not, other, not what other countries should do or should not do. Um, so, so clearly from this previous plot, um, CGTN is constantly disseminating these counter narratives. But we also find that they're also used in response to um, specific, when specific events happen. So during the Hong Kong protests, these, there's a lot of refuting of international coverage, but in refuting kind of international coverage and reporting on China, these, these attributes are emphasized. Um, so for example, uh, when the Wall Street Journal says two decades after handover to China, Hong Kong is losing a special luster, CGTN then comes, comes back and quotes an expert as saying, Hong Kong prospered under the one country, two systems um, set up. Uh, when Wall Street Journal says Hong Kong's, you know, has no free elections, you know, it says Hong Kong has substantial leeway to elect its leaders on paper, but in practice, China's thumb is on its scales, then um, Xi Jinping comes and says the head of the CCP liaison office in Hong Kong congratulates Carrie Lam who um, in her election victory and says the election was open, free and fa fair and just. We also see and saw this with COVID. Um, again, there's a lot of refuting of specific points that international media is making, but it's always emphasizing these same frames and narratives. So when um, Wall Street Journal says that China's factory and non-factory activity is plunging as the economy is struggling, Xi Jinping says the ep coronavirus epidemic won't change um, economic growth trend. When uh, Washington Post says that China's keeping information um, in a tight leash, then Xi Jinping emphasizes how in China, authorities are asking people for tip-offs on cover-ups, attempts to play down numbers, et cetera. Um, and when Wall Street Journal says that Beijing's diplomatic efforts have grown more aggressive um, and has received pushback, then Xi Jinping's really emphasizing kind of China's friendliness, its cooperation with other countries um, saying that the country's friend circle is expanded. Another point, another example of this cooperation um, comes when Xi Jinping says that 
uh, in response to Western uh, the Wall Street Journal saying Beijing seems to be appear, uh, stalling international efforts, then Xi Jinping says that Western country needs to drop this unnecessary rhetoric and cooperation is needed to prevail over the pandemic. Um, to put this in context, uh, one thing to note is that CGTN, when it's operating globally, is operating in a context of um, a free media environment where it's not in isolation, but is competing for attention and audience. And so how does it compare? Um, when we look at the uh, sentiment of tweets we can see, as probably you would expect, that CGTN content about China is much less negative than reporting on China by international media outlets. We just use a very um, straightforward dictionary-based approach to sentiment classification. We find that about half of Wall Street Journal and Fox News reporting on China contains negative sentiment. For Washington Post, CNN, and BBC, this is around 60%. But in contrast, only 25% of content produced by CGTN related to China. So this is only related to China, content related to China contain negative sentiment. I don't know if, for, for those of you listening, if this is higher than you expected or lower, um, but there is some negative sentiment in CG Chan's coverage, but it's much, much lower than um, other international media outlets. We also did and, hand coding of uh, content quick, from CG Chan. Yep. Yeah, just a quick question. Is it the case that um, sort of like Western media outlets tend to report more negative things? Like is the baseline negative sentiment of like a Washington Post article negative, whereas the CGTN might just be like emphasizing like positive things. Cause if, if they're like trying to spin and make it sound good, it sounds more like, you know, press releases and less like, uh, you know like trying to drive people to watch media coverage. Yeah, so there is this um, kind of, when we look at policy documents, policy documents there is some uh, discussion of how these Chinese state controlled media outlets, when they're doing their outward work, they're trying to do positive um, journalism. But when we look at the tweets that um, are not about China, then the sentiment is very similar between CGTN and the international media outlets. So I think what the, the CGTN and kind of our Chinese media has found is that when you're positive, you don't get as much attention. And so part of the localization strategy of looking more like a just international media outlet is to do the breaking news in the style of other international media outlets. But then when it comes to reporting about China, that, 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 that's, that's not um, the case. Another, another way to get at Justin's question is being great to see a similar chart for tweets about the United States. Mm. And the U.S., you know, again, the same the same media outlets, but focused on the United States. And I guess yeah. my, that, that would be a very useful point of comparison for this chart. And I suspect you see more negative sentiment from the Wall Street Journal, CNN, and so on about the U.S. than you do about China from the CGTN. Um, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, no, that's a great idea, though. Um, we should definitely do that. That's so great. Yeah, because we hadn't um, we hadn't um, kind of picked out specific countries, but um, that's definitely something we can do. Uh, so another thing we looked at just the volume. Uh, this is just the number of tweets against the stacked uh, area plot. We're comparing the number of tweets produced by CGTN that contain reframing only. So this is reframing narratives about China with all tweets related to China made by Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, CNN, Breaking News, and BBC Breaking News. Obviously, there are many more uh, other international media outlets that report on China, but what we just wanted to show is that if you look at CGTN reframing content only, that volume vastly outstrips content about China produced by any one international media outlet. Um, when you actually look at something like um, BBC Breaking News and CNN Breaking News, very, very few of their posts actually relate to China. Um, and the, of these particular outlets, uh, Wall Street Journal has the most reporting on China, uh, relatively speaking. But relative, I mean, in, in this time period, CGTN is producing more reframing content about China than Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, CNN, BBC combined. But um, 
CG Tian is competing for attention and CG Tian content receives less engagement. So this bar plot shows the median engagement, likes on the uh, left, replies in the middle, retweets on the right, um, with each tweet per 1 million followers for CG Tian, which is at the top, and then uh, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, CNN, BBC um, on the bottom. And right now what I'm showing you is only reframing tweets for CGTN and tweets that are have negative sentiment related to China from the other media outlets. And on average, Twitter users are engaging much less with the CGTN reframing um, content than content produced by um, other news outlets, especially Fox News and BBC. Um, it depends on what metric you look at. With likes, they're doing relatively okay. Um, but much less when you look at replies or re retweets. And um, I should say that this picture is very similar if we just take all CN CGTN tweets about China and all um, tweets about China from the other media outlets. It's just that in general, uh, CGTN, there's less user engagement with CGTN content than content produced by other international media outlets. Um, okay, so to wrap up, I'm just going to talk briefly about implications. I just want to highlight two implications. One is that CGTN has to compete in this free media environment for attention. They've tried to do it by really boosting the volume of content and reporting breaking news, just like other international media outlets, but their engagement still uh, lags behind. And the other is, you know, like, what do you make of this content? Um, is it soft power? which many countries do, or is it something like information operations or sharp power? And I think that really depends on how you wanna define deception. When we look at this content, um, there's no deception through lying. When you look at CGTN content, there's no outright lying, but there's a lot of omission, distortion, and misdirection. And there are many who would consider that to be deception, such that when you communicate with omission, distortion, or misdirection, those who are receiving information can't make fully informed decisions when they agree. Um, and so then we might label what CGTN, CGTN is doing more along the lines of sharp power. But I think one point here is also that I actually think when soft power is communicated by a state, it's inevitably going to contain omission, distortion, and misdirection because it's about emphasizing those soft power resources. So you're going to leave other stuff out. Um, so I think, yeah, that this is not answering the question of is this soft power or sharp power. I think it depends on how we define those concepts. Okay, I'll start, I'll stop there and look forward to the questions and the conversations. Okay, so we have uh, uh, an initial question here from uh, Bodhi Yang that I'll ask. And then if uh, there needs to be a follow up then we can open it up. So the question here, uh, Bodhi asks, from the graph of the text analysis, we see that the total number of tweets, it varies uh, greatly and very irregularly through time. Uh, do you have an explanation for this pattern? Is there any possible investigation of the variance? Uh, what about the number of tweets relating to things in the world, like a breakout of international events or something like that? Uh yeah, so this is definitely driven, is, is event driven. Like the big peak that you see um, in 2020 is COVID. It's like the spread of COVID uh, globally. Um, and there are others here that are kind of other international events. Because what I, I think the thing is, so CGTN is a state controlled media outlet. It doesn't want audiences to think it's that. So it has to act like a, any other international media outlet. And to do that, it has to cover breaking news. Um, and I, I think actually it, it, the one of the most retweeted and replied and liked tweets that CGTM put out over this entire time period is when CGTM broke the news that the Thai King had died. So it actually broke it before BBC and CNN. And when it did that, it had way more engagement with its content. So I think it rec they recognize the fact that if they want to be able to compete for attention, they have to do uh, kind of breaking news coverage. Um, even if they're not the one to break it, they have to cover. And so that's driving a lot of this. Steve, did you wanna uh, ask a couple questions? 
Yeah. Um, first, just a methodological one. Go going back to the role of human readers, um, you, you didn't you didn't talk a lot about the details, but I the basic questions. One is about how robust are the tweet characterizations based on the human readers to the particular human readers, um, assuming you had multiple readers, and how did you check that? Um, uh, are you talking about the data exploration phase yeah, or the data the, analysis phase? The data, as I understood it, maybe I've got it wrong, the data exploration phase fed into the categorizations that you used in your analysis phase. Uh, I mean, only in informing our new categorizations and new coding rules. So we actually don't impose like things like intercoder agreement when we're exploring the data. We want readers, which include like myself <laughs> and also other PhD students, as well as um, kind of, it, it basically includes people with a diversity of backgrounds. We take the content, but everyone knows something at least about China or are, are able to uh, um, know something about China and know the kind of policy uh, background. Um, we are going in, you know, as ourselves, looking at these tweets, labeling them in however ways we think are salient and going through as many tweets as we can until we don't see kind of new things. And then we come together and meet and talk about what we each thought. Um, and then through that discussion and looking at results like from a topic model, we were like, oh, that's interesting. What's that? Oh, that, that, that links to kind of this sort of theory or that challenges this theory or, um, this looks like, and when we someone read the policy document, we're like, this is actually what's in exactly in the policy documents. Um, so that's really all about exploration. And then from that, we say, okay, it seems like the most salient thing, important thing is these narratives. So we now say we're going to code for these four narratives. And we have for each narrative coding rules based on um, kind of the policy documents. And then we actually then have new research assistants who weren't part of the exploration phase, read those based and code based on the coding rules. And then we check for intercoder agreement. And that's and when we get above 80% there, then we use that for training data. Okay, but, so, but here's the methodological question, which is if you had started out with a different set of intelligent readers in the exploration phase, would you have ended up in the same place? And I think so. I think so. Okay. Because that how, do we, yeah. how do we, how do we assess that? I, I don't know if there's a way to assess that other than uh, you just bring in more people and at some point they're not going to have new ideas um, or you do it over time enough over time that kind of new things are not discovered. And I, I should say that our data exploration phase lasted um, over a year. Um, but, but I do think this is something, so I, I think we came to the most interesting way and way that is um, kind of honest to the data as well as relevant to kind of theories and substantive knowledge. But I totally recognize that someone else could look at this data and other people have looked at this data and have looked at it differently. I, th I think there's a, a working paper, a policy paper that looks at this content by topic from a topic model or by, and by sentiment. Um, but I think what I would argue is that we did that, but I just don't think that's as the, the kind of results from that are as kind of interesting or informative. I think I, a different kind of question, you know, one of your, one of the conclusions you mentioned at the end is there's no deception through lying. Um, that, that seems unsurprising because lying outright is probably not a successful strategy in a competitive media environment. But I wonder, is it possible with your data to parse things more, more finely into topics where, say, especially topics that are discussed domestically, where there, where there isn't much of a competitive media environment or there's less of one, mainly because the rest of the world might not be interested in certain topics and seeing whether you find a, a different extent or a different type of distortion there. So just as a piece of background, I have the impression, which 
you, you can free, feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong, that in the Maoist era, that the domestic media engaged in lots of outright lying, basically because there was no check on the, on the domestic newspapers and so on. Um, and so I, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of how you can assess how and what extent the media environment in which state-controlled media operates is constrained or shaped by that environment. Sorry, do you mean the do China's domestic environment or the... Yeah, I mean, I think if I were to look at domestic tweets about domestic aspects of China that the rest of the world's not paying attention to, if I were going to see any outright line, it would be there, not, not on outward facing media because the CGTN is operating in a, in, a, in a competitive media environment internationally. So if you make outright lies, you just, you get caught and you look silly and your credibility suffers. So if I were going to see lying anywhere, it would be in domains, either time periods or on topics um, where lying was not a very uh, successful or viable strategy. Yeah, um, I think that's something we can, yeah, we, should, we could definitely look into with domestic um, coverage of domestic events. One thing I would say, though, is that a lot of this coverage is at the level of generality where it's not about facts that you can lie about. <laughs> it's about perceptions, opinion, descriptions of certain things. Um, for example, I think the, the example with um, kind of the COVID examples are interesting in looking at what they do, right? Or maybe, um, yeah, so in this one, they are citing Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> you know, like there, there are these layers of things that they can rely on like media quotes experts or media is just reporting what leaders say. And that's not gonna be a lie because they, the leader did say that. Mm -hmm. And so in reporting that, uh, what, what, so um, I think the it kind of not analogy, but a lot of US social media platforms are really struggling with labeling what is or is not misinformation. And what CG Tan is doing is walking that gray area where the, there's, I don't even think for domestic reporting, but we should look into it. There's going to be outright lies because there's so much, um, kind of, I would say deception that can happen without outright lies because of emphasis or omission or redirection of attention. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Tara, could we let uh, Larry Diamond uh, speak so he's he has a question be good for him to ask it I think um, so Jennifer this is fascinating thank you so much I'm wondering do you have any strategy in the future as you carry forward this research to measure the uh, impact of CGTN tweeting on global public opinion on you know what gets retweeted uh, so on and so forth. And just on the question you were uh, debating with uh, Steve and Justin, you know, um, first of all, Russia does an awful lot of um, misleading, if not outright false tweeting. And a lot of this um, global public opinion shaping is about kind of gray zone insinuation and sometimes per, promulgation of conspiracy theories and things. And it doesn't sound like China's doing much of that. No, um, the, I, it's not, at least CGTN is not. So I, I should recognize that there are other outward messaging efforts mm -hmm. that are not done through state media. But okay. with kind of CGTN state media, it is not doing that. The focus is either on kind of breaking news or on talking about China um, and the, the ways uh, in which kind of China is and positioning China with these particular attributes. It's very little about um, 
uh, kind of the, we we haven't in this time period seen content that falls out of those kind of two major tasks. So um, that raises another question, uh, which is, um, do you have any strategy to compare uh, CGTN? Um, you know, opinion shaping behavior through the Twitter sphere with other instruments of Chinese, you know, global um, opinion formation. And then again, back to the impact question. Yeah, sorry, I didn't answer your impact question. I think we, um, this paper is taking longer than <laughs> we wanted, mostly because uh, I've been working on some other stuff. But um, so I just want to finish, I would definitely want to finish this. And then we definitely have talked about doing uh, more experimental, try using more experimental methods to look at the effect of this. Um, uh, either effect of kind of CGTN content or how, how it, when, when is it effective or less effective? So mm -hmm. that's definitely something that we've talked about and we actually do have a kind of experimental research design to do it. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if we'll do it, um, we'll see you after I finish this, this is submitted. Uh, and then to the question of comparing this with other strategies, I think the, the, um, I think the question there is really about data availability, not, you know, whether we can collect data from Twitter, but rather, um, questions around attribution and some of the more covert stuff or, um, disguise stuff that's going on, do we have enough uh, confidence about attribution to say that, uh, uh, like to, to include it in our data analysis? So I think there are some, we have some question marks um, about whether that's feasible, but that is also something we have thought about. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, can we give uh, Sean Connor the ability to, uh, to, to talk? He's got a couple questions for Jennifer. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, so Jennifer, I was curious, um, as I was watching this, um, I, have you derived any insights about the structure of the content management, like behind the scenes, for example, um, is everything written in a single style, in a single voice? Are there distinct voices? How many? Um, and what other things might we be able to derive from that, that line of thought and questions? Yeah, so actually, this is something that I think is super interesting because uh, I'm very interested in how the political objectives in general of authoritarian regimes interact with bureaucracies that don't, you know, always function as intended. And I think same with CG. So, sorry, I sh I just say that the CGTN infrastructure is much broader than what I talked about today because I only focused on CGTN's. Kind of social media presence and they're just the Twitter presence. But there's a big strategy of CGTN that's about localization. So setting up kind of television broadcasts uh, in around the world where reporters and anchors, um, those who are on screen are from their from from that country, but where CGTN is driving kind of the uh, agenda and the direction of the reporting. And there's been a lot of work, great work on this, especially with um, kind of Chin Chinese media in Africa. Um, so I think kind of, I would definitely, I'm happy to send over references and I, would, I think I would definitely encourage you to look at that literature for how CGTN has kind of the, the organizational structure on the broadcast media side. In terms of social media, what we see is that there are definitely um, uh, stylistic guide guidelines, uh, but there is also difference in tone and style. Um, and one thing we looked at for a while is what content gets removed. So what CGTN tweets are posted and then removed to see if kind of, are those mistakes or like were those ones that were you know, the wrong tone. Um, we just don't have enough of a large enough data set to say anything systematic and it's more anecdotal, but I would say to answer your question that there are definitely um, divergences in style and tone, um, but 
but then there's seems to be kind of some mechanism to try to correct that to to, to focus the um, style and tone at least of what CG Tan is putting out on Twitter. Oh, sorry, I just say um, just at a kind of broader level that the there, if we think about CG Tan as just the bureaucracy, they're under a ton of pressure because they have to have that really high volume because <laughs> that, that's part of part of the strategy. They have to have this high volume. And so they need lots of content, but it's not always easy to kind of get enough content. And that's where some of this kind of, I think, tension and voice and style um, come in. Got it. Thank you. And that, that kind of leads to a, a follow-up question, which was, I was curious about how they do the coordination, like how they manage the standpoint, filter and reframe um, and still stay timely compared to other news outlets. So it's, it's a, I mean, it's a, if, if they're doing it with a huge organization, it's, it's an amazing feat, right? To be very consistent and on point and on time. Yeah. So I think this is where they are. I mean, this, their media conglomerate with China national radio and China radio international. So um, there is some sourcing of kind of on the breaking news reporting side across, across these um, channels. Um, so, so there is quite a large uh, bureaucracy that is um, kind of working in this area. And, and even though, yeah, and, and as I mentioned, my, what I'm focusing on is quite a narrow part of what they're doing, but there is this broader bureaucracy with kind of other specializations and resources behind it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think with that, that's gonna be our last question for the sort of formal exchange. We're going to, briefly pause, we'll turn off the recording and then we can have a more open-ended discussion. And I just wanna flag that we'll start that with uh, uh, Glenn's question. So Jennifer, thank you very much and look forward to continuing the chat here in a moment. Thanks so much for having me.